South East, South Asia was in trade economics and environment, a Kathmandu based think tank, and also on behalf of ICTSD. I mean, here yeah, our so, I mean, theme is service over maximizing benefits for the LDCs. I mean, in order to set the tone, so, I mean, let me provide them some backgrounds. If we look at the Uruguay rounds, I mean, final results of Uruguay round, the GATS, in particular, Article 4.3. I mean, it incites a provision that provides special priority in the service sector and modes of supply of interest of LDC. And 2003 LDC negotiation modalities, and also the annexe of the Hong Kong ministerial, 2005 Hong Kong ministerial declaration, reiterated the commitments of special and differential treatment to LDC in service sector. And then next step, I and mean, in order to enable member to provide prefer preferential treatment to service and service supplier of LDC, the Earth Ministerial meeting held in December 2011, agreed to allow WTO members to have EMF obligation. And this waiver is generally known as LDC service waiver. I mean, to put it in simple term, this service waiver, it exempts WTO members from EMFN obligations when providing preferential treatment to service and service supplier of LDC. And further, after this 2011 decisions, further decisions were made in Bali and also in Nairobi to operationalize LDC waiver. And also, I mean, it also extended the duration of waiver up to 2000, 31st December 2030. And as agreed in Bali, LDC group developed a collective request identifying the preferences of LDC services and service supplier, which have commercial value to the LDC and which could promote their economic benefits. And they submitted, circulated it to the members in 2014 July. And if we look at that collective request, it generally covers four major areas. One is related to market access and national treatment obligation. The second is with regard to visa work permit and residence permit and related fees and measures. Fourth is recognition, qualification, and accreditation matters. And the last one that is, I mean, put in annex is that's the sectors and professions of interest of the LDC. And in response to this, to this request, combined request list, 24 WTO members, including several developing countries, have submitted notification for preferential treatment to service and service supplier of LDC, but it is mostly focused on areas of market access, which has ignored other aspects of the request. And I mean, if you look at the export performance of LDC, I mean, despite all these positive discriminations and and the commitments to provide special and differential treatment to LDC, the service performance of LDC is not much encouraging. I mean, if you look at the growth of service exports of LDC during 2000 and 2016, it has increased or it has expanded by 12% on average per year. But it's export time. Mean, the export of services of LDC, it has slowed down since 2014. And this downward trend further deteriorated in 2016, and it declined by 4%. 
In 2016, LDC export of services was US dollar 31.9 billion, and which is only 0.66% of global exports of services. And LDC as a group, they suffered deficit of US dollar 32.9 billion in service traded. And that this, the amount of this deficit is higher than the total export of service of LDCs. And if you look at the domestic economy of LDC, share of service sector in GDP was more than 50% in 2016 compared to 41% in 1991. But the service export, it constitutes only 17% of total exports of ELDC. So it indicates that there has been have some transformation in the economy of ELDC, but the transformation is between service and agriculture. And this kind of report card on the service uh, on, on the service trade performance of LDC, it doesn't provide an optimistic scenario to achieve the target of Istanbul program of actions. Mm -hmm. And which says to double share of LDC exports in global exports by 2020. And also, I mean, to diversify the export base of LDC. And in this context, the question arises, how is the commercial value of the offers made by WTO members under LDC service waiver? How can preference giving WTO members can concretize the preference to catalyze market opportunity for LDCs and facilitate their integration in multilateral trade trading system. How can LDC maximize I mean, service over vis-a-vis their domestic preparedness? What could be the innovative operational mod modalities to maximize the benefit of service waiver. I mean, in this session, we are going to answer I mean, some of these questions. And for this, we have four panelists. Professor Mustafa Jiraman is a distinguished fellow, Center for Policy Dialogue, Daika Daka. And our another I mean, panelist is His Excellency Mr. Deepak Dital, ambassador and prominent representative of Nepal to United Nations office in Geneva. I mean, he promised I mean, to come over here after completing this closing session. We have Hadil Hijaji, Director, WTA Advisor Limited, Oxford, Geneva. And we have Professor Pierre Schwab, Senior Trade Specialist, Old Bank, Geneva. I think I've, I, I got your name right. <laughs> so without much ado, I, I, I give floor to Professor Mustafiz Rehman. And you have 12 minutes, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, it's always a pleasure to collaborate with uh, SOTI. Uh, SOTI is one of the leading think tanks in South Asia. And my center, uh, Center for Policy Dialogue, works very closely with SOTI. And we know that SOTI has worked a lot on services and services waiver and uh, has done uh, a lot of negotiations in, uh, in the WTO in order to have that services waiver. In fact, uh, the, uh, the submission on behalf of the LDC group, the request list uh, was, uh, was submitted on behalf of the LDCs by Nepal. Uh, so, so this is also uh, important. Now, let me uh, begin by saying that uh, obviously we know that services are the major contributor to our GDP. Uh, for the LDCs, 45% of the GDP comes from the services. For my own country, Bangladesh, 52% uh, of GDP is contributed by the services. Now, if we look at the global trade, uh, we have seen, as uh, Porsche has mentioned, 
uh, that uh, that uh, most of our countries we export manufacturing goods. Uh, for example, Bangladesh exports uh, uh, the manufacturing goods is, uh, are constitute about 92 percent of our total export. Um, but we think that we have competitive advantages in services as well. Uh, but the global trade regime and the rules of the game are such that we, uh, where our economies, uh, economy has a lot of uh, services, uh, but uh, we don't trade in services. So we think that uh, the services waiver is one of the ways to make trade fair. Uh, so when we talk about free trade, we think that trade cannot be free if it is not fair. And one of the elements of fairness is, is the services uh, waiver. Um, so, so this is one. The second is that uh, we know that uh, you know, uh, about 4.5 trillion dollars of services trade takes place, 23 percent of the global trade. But there are other estimations which tells that it is almost 50 percent of the global trade is now services. Because many of the manufacturing trade services are embedded in, into the trade. So that is also very, very important. For example, the, the, all the LDCs, we enjoy duty-free, quota-free in almost all the countries and in, for almost all the products, excepting ready-made garments in the USA. For all LDCs, duty-free, quota-free in almost in all the countries. But then uh, you have only the local value addition. If you cannot take the, the whole, whole value chain. Uh, for example, you know, Bangladesh is the world's second largest exporter of uh, apparel after China. But if you look at what is the value addition within Bangladesh, the labor component of the retail value is, is just 6%. So it's very important that we have also you know, um, capacity to, 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 to be in the retail services, capacity to be in the merchandising services in the, in the, in the, in the markets where we sell. So I think if we take the value chain, uh, only this type of services waiver and access to the services market, preferential access, can really help us in getting a greater share of the value in the value chain. I think this is something which is, which is very important to, to, to keep in mind. And from that perspective, the services waiver which was you know, given in 2011 for 15 years, up to 2026, now it has been extended up to 2030. But what value will this have if we take very practically? Bangladesh is going to graduate, will be considered for graduation from the LDCs in 2018. And after two triennial you know, uh, reviews, we will be out of the LDCs in 2024. Same is for Nepal. Nepal will also graduate, will be taken for graduation in 2018. And they will also graduate out in 2024. So really, you know, this, this uh, prolonged implementation and the difficulties, etc., etc., which we are discussing, you know, the window of opportunity is very, very narrow for us, really. So I think that if we cannot, and, and the signs are not very encouraging in, in MC11, so if we do not have you know, something immediate uh, in terms of really taking advantage of, uh, of the services waiver, both in terms of the market access and in terms of the rules, then really it won't matter. For, for, for the LDCs. Most of the LDCs will be graduating uh, you know, out, of, uh, out of the um, LDC group uh, in any case within the next six to eight years. So I think it is, it is very important that, uh, that, uh, that we operationalize it as, you, as, you, as, as the chair has mentioned. How, how do you operationalize it? But per se, I must say that if we compare the, what has been offered uh, by the 25 submissions, 51 countries, if we take European Union to be you know, 27 countries, yeah. or 26 now. <laughs> um, so, uh, so if we take those, we see that you know, uh, the, the, those, offer, uh, those offers, uh, about 40% are, are, are uh, you know, uh, the GATS. Um, uh, about 50% go beyond GATS, GATS plus various uh, services uh, waivers which are offered by the developed countries in various PTAs. And it has been calculated that about 25% of the offers which the developed countries have made are, uh, are precisely for the LDCs. So one criticism is that you know, the offers that the developed countries have made in the 25 submission, many of these are MFN, national treatment, etc. doesn't go beyond what has been in GATS. It's true partially, but I think there is also a lot of opportunity because, as I said, 50% of the offers are GATS plus and 25% are for the 
LDCs precisely. It goes beyond the PTAs and the FTAs that the developed countries have. So this is a window of opportunity. Now, if we really want to uh, uh, operationalize it, I think there are two, two issues. One is the regulatory regime. Market access has been offered, but the regulations with regard to the economic needs test, with regard to the labor needs test, with regard to certification, equivalence of degrees, et cetera, et cetera, licensing requirements, visa, et cetera, those regimes have not been changed. So if we really want to materialize those opportunities, the regulations in the developed countries will also have to be changed. So this is one. Second, one can also think about whether one can have a quota in, at least in some of the modes. And with regard to the mode, of, obviously the LDCs have more in, in, you know, interest in mode four. Um, but if you look at the offers, um, you know, there are most of the offers uh, are in mode one and mode three. Uh, maximum is in mode two, you know, uh, consumption abroad. And uh, with regard to mode four, uh, the, the, the uh, movement of natural persons, uh, the offers are, 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 are rather limited, I would say. So one of the types of offers which, for example, uh, the Chile, uh, Chilean offer, you will see that there are clusters where because you cannot separate modes, you know, mode one, mode two, mode three, mode four, because these are very much related. You can have a market access, but if you don't have commercial presence or, 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 or movement of natural persons, you cannot really access the, the opportunity. So this clustering, horizontal, uh, uh, clustering is very important. But we see that in many of the offers, these are disjointed. So that type of you know, clustering will be important in terms of operationalizing. So that is from the, um, you know, from, the, uh, from the developed country side. But from our own side, I think most of the LDCs are really not also, we haven't taken the, you know, done, done the homework in terms of really taking advantage of it. What, which exactly are the areas where we can take up the offers? Um, what uh, we should do, what type of equivalence we should have, what type of uh, human resources we should have, you know, the regulatory regimes which will be compatible with the demands in developed countries. I think that homework we haven't really started to do. Uh, as I said, the window of opportunity is very narrow, and uh, if we really want to uh, materialize that, uh, this is the way uh, that we should uh, we should go. Uh, one issue which uh, which uh, we we have to really hammer is is that, you know, in terms of mode four movement of natural person, it is mainly still the developing countries. For example, Bangladesh, the remittance earnings is about 15 billion dollar uh, in an economy of 220 billion dollars, so quite significant. Uh, but uh, about uh, more than 70 percent is, is from Middle East and other developing countries, not from the uh, developed, uh, developed countries. So I think that the identified sectors which, which are there in the offer list, construction, uh, caring services, medical services, um, uh, business, um, uh, business uh, services, so those which have been offered, I think that we should make uh, our own uh, you know, preparations in order to how to uh, really build up those skills. And then, uh, and then the second is uh, equivalence of uh, certification, equivalence of uh, degrees. Uh, so all, the, all, all those will also have to be done in a compatible manner. I think if we can do that strategically, uh, I think that there is enormous opportunities for, for us to get into new areas like mode four, but also what is very important as I was mentioning is to really take the value chains in, the, in, in our um, goods export. Like for example, apparels, as I was mentioning, only 6% is, is the local, uh, you know, the, the labor component. But most of it is in retail and in, in merchandising. In, in, so, so those services have been opened up now. So if we can you know, set, and set up uh, retail shops, if we can have marketing uh, uh, you know, agencies over there, then the value, the, the, the value addition in the value chain, I think, uh, and for, for our countries, can be significantly enhanced. So I would say that uh, both in terms of demanding the, the change in the regulations and making it more LDC friendly, and also in terms of our own uh, homework, I think we have to do a lot in both terms. 
Thank you, Chair. I, I'm sorry that I will have to leave uh, for the airport, and uh, <laughs> but uh, I thought I would share my some of my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rahman. And despite your I mean, tight schedule, you have contributed over here. And the doctor, Professor Ray, <coughs> Professor Mustafa, he underscored the importance of service waivers to make trade much more fair, fairer. And also the importance, I mean, as service is embedded in manufacturing, manufacturing I mean, products, I mean, it helps to reap higher value in the value chain. And another issue, I mean, he raised is, I mean, it, I, I think that, that is quite important. Well, the offer made by developed countries, maybe it's, I mean, that's, that is gas plush, and 25% of the offer that is particularly for LDC, but these offer are made in isolation, not as a package that benefits to LDC. And, and because of other restrictions, particularly in the moment of natural person, I mean, that, these restrictions may nullify the market access offered through preference. I mean, that is one big I mean, issue, and he highlighted. Thank you, thank you, Professor Mustafa Rahman. Now I invite Adil. Thank you, Pash. You asked several questions. Let me try to capture some of them, building on uh, what Professor uh, Rahman said and try to complement what he said. What is the value of the preferences for the LDCs? Uh, I, I, I um, uh, intentionally uh, omitted the commercial value because I cannot answer that question. Um, I think the value lies, for me, um, it lies in the fact that we now have a discourse on services. We have a discourse on LDC services. We have a discourse and we have awareness among members that LDCs export services. I remember in the lead up to the preparation of the collective request, we were advising the LDC group and many members um, had misguided impressions about LDC services and services exports. Um, they, they, there was the misguided conception that LDCs export primarily tourism services, export services in mode four, and this is you know, what they want. Um, what we know today is much more than what we knew three years ago. We now know that LDCs export all types of services and often in all, all modes of supply. LDCs export, uh, as I said yesterday in the other panel, animation services, IT services, including extremely sophisticated services, graphic design services, education services, um, um, financial services, including in mode three. Um, they export all services. It's true that most exports happen in the region, especially when we talk about mode three, but this is also, it's a start. This is how you start. You start trading with your neighbors and then you expand beyond the neighborhood. Um, and I think this, uh, the, the system is maturing. The system understands today that we have, uh, we have, we have services from LDCs and these LDCs um, export services, different types of services in different modes of supply. This is, uh, uh, this is a big step forward in my view. Um, if we look at the, the, the notifications, uh, the 24 notifications that were uh, submitted, and we try to compare them with the collective request, the picture is also mixed. Um, on the one hand, uh, some of the uh, notified preferences are not of much value, uh, especially those that are in mode two. Others have value. Um, Chile, Norway, Iceland, uh, and the EU uh, came up with interesting um, preferences on mode four and on categories of uh, natural persons. This is a start, I'm not saying it's enough, but this is a start. We have to look at things uh, from a historical perspective and see where this is leading us. Um, some countries, India waived, uh, for example, the uh, visa fee uh, for, for uh, LDC uh, serv business uh, service providers. So we have certain innovative and certain, uh, certain preferences that are, uh, go even beyond what was mentioned in the, or requested in the collective request. Others are equal to the collective request. I think the whole story starts from the, 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 the premise should be like, what is a preference and what, are, what we have on the table are preferences or not. And 
I don't have the answer for this because the, the members did not declare whether they are offering preferences or whether they are extending their MFN treatment to everyone else, to, to the LDCs. So I think one of the starting points should be that members who notified their preferences and members who will notify their preferences, they should clarify whether they are offering MFN or whether they are offering actual preferences. We tried to make an exercise in approximation and try to compare the uh, 24 uh, notifications with what we thought is the applied regime, which is the DDA offers, uh, or one can even say, uh, take the best PTA and try to come up with uh, an approximation of where do we stand um, uh, compared to that. And the result was uh, quite interesting. If we look at, if we take the DDA offers as, as, as the, basically the applied MFN regime, uh, we see that 40% uh, of the um, notified preferences, they are equal to the DDA offers. If we take the PTA as the applied regime, the best PTA, the treatment that is granted to trading partners in the best PTA, um, then 68% equal uh, the treatment that is offered to uh, trading partners in an FTA or PTA uh, arrangement. But 25% of the notified preferences go beyond the best PTA. So those could be treated as preferences. If we take the uh, collective request as a, as a benchmark, 23% um, of the notified preferences uh, are equal to the uh, collective request and 46% are beyond the collective request. But 18% out of these 46% are in mode two. So you know, the, the actual uh, preferences or not notified preferences that go beyond the collective request are, are much less than that. The problem is that whether these preferences or notified preferences that were granted or offered by, uh, by, by members uh, that go beyond the collective request, whether they were offered by the right members in brackets. Uh, or, I mean, as uh, Professor Rahman said, uh, for Bangladesh, Nepal, and Cambodia, and other um, uh, LDCs, uh, for them, for example, uh, Gulf markets are the, the, the markets where um, they export mode 4 uh, services. So, Chile, the EU, uh, Norway, and Iceland's uh, inclusion of new categories might not be of much, uh, of much help here. But the, I think the message is that we have, um, we, we have, we have, a, we, we started discussing uh, the matter seriously, and we have a discourse on, on, on this. And the way I see it is that um, this should be an ongoing process. This is. Um, this should be, we should continue the dialogue, um, including with members who already uh, submitted notifications and offered, um, offered preferences to LDCs. Um, we should continue the dialogue and improve the dialogue uh, by uh, clarifying whether what uh, was offered is, uh, is, is a preference or not, um, by trying to um, assess whether what was offered uh, responds to the actual real life needs of LDC services uh, exporters. Um, the, the, the collective request was a great uh, step uh, in the right direction to come up with a request or a demand from the LDCs on what they want, but we all know how this came about. Uh, LDCs at the time didn't have a complete picture of what their needs are. So we need to continue this process, and this process should include and should, um, should, should be inclusive of also the uh, service providers, and not only just government officials, who often have little knowledge about the uh, actual uh, problems and barriers that uh, their service providers um, face. Um, we should encourage um, members, including those that are already, have already submitted their notifications, to um, extend um, their, the, 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 the treatment in their best PTAs to LDCs immediately. I think this is something that has not been done sufficiently. Um, and what we should have, uh, ideally, uh, in order to uh, answer your second question, Posh, um, what could be done uh, in order to come up with innovative modalities to maximize the benefits of the waiver for LDCs, I think what we need to, to have is a monitoring mechanism. Um, the current mechanism or the current process as the T as, at, at the CTS is not sufficient in, in this respect. What we need is, is, is a mechanism, a multilateral mechanism uh, or a process or fora 
where the quality of the notif notifications is assessed against the actual needs of the um, uh, LDC service providers. And this should be done on a regular basis. Um, there should be a discourse and discussion at a multilateral level where the issue is revisited and discussed and the quality of the preferences against the actual needs of the service providers in LDCs um, are discussed. I would stop um, here. Thank you. Thank you, Adil, for for the for your own recommendations. That is, I mean, I, I, I found it quite interesting. I mean, to extend best PTA to all LDC immediately. I mean, that could be one. I mean, approach to to improve the value of this service, however, and also. <clears throat> to analyze the quality of notification I mean, against the potential of actual utilizations of those. Okay, so well, well, I mean, we, we have, uh, in, in Saudi, we have also, I mean, working on service waiver, and we also discussed with, with the private sector, I mean, how to maximize benefit out of this service waiver. I, again, it's, I mean, I hadn't said, there are, I mean, again, so, I mean, a good offer from the developed and other developing countries, but but the small I mean, things that that becomes a big hurdle for service providers and services of LDC. For example, just I just cite I mean, a few examples. Well, so, I mean, in Nepal in Nepal, so, I mean, Chinese tourists. I mean, that is I think I mean, that's the second time our the flow of Chinese to, tourists is second after India. But, but, but the requirement for Chinese, I mean, in order to live, we provide visa on arrival to most of the countries, including China. So if Chinese citizen wants to travel to Nepal, they don't need any visa, right? They can get on arrival. But Chinese regulations, I mean, that doesn't allow any Chinese citizen to leave the country without visa stamp in their passport. But uh, we have two German consulate offices in China, one in Lhasa, Tibet, and one in Shanghai. So for Chinese German citizens, it would be quite <coughs> problematic I mean, to get visa in order to visit Nepal. So that small I mean, regulations that restrict I mean, all the offers you have. And similarly, I mean, in, in medical services, well, we have so many tourists coming from developed countries, including Europe, US, and Canada. If they get sick over there, I mean, we, Nepal is quite famous for trekking and other, I mean, adventurous tourism. If they broke their hand or if they get sick, they visit to the doctor. But, but, but they get, I mean, simply fasted and sort of fasted or primary treatment. They, 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 they don't get I mean, serious medical treatment over there. Because the insurance company doesn't pay if they get I mean, that medical service in Nepal. So with, with having primary I mean, health service. After getting, I mean, private health service, either they fly to Bangkok or fly to Europe, I mean, to get I mean, full treatment. So the problem of that, that and the portability of I mean, insurance policy, that has become I mean, big hurdles in promoting medical services. And similarly, we also contacted, I mean, our travel agency, I mean, to promote I mean, tourism in Nepal. I just don't get it. The faster you can graduate, the better. There will be transitional pain from graduation. You lose some preferences. And maybe we need to create one more acronym in the WTO, recently graduated countries or recently graduated members who would legitimately claim for slightly longer preferences over a transition. But to bemoan the fact that we are no longer an LDC Hello, but I, are we on the same planet? We should applaud, because that will reflect 
far-reaching changes in economic structure that raises income per capita beyond the level uh, of an LDC. So those premises I find, I find very difficult um, to, to just understand and, and to accept. Now, in my analysis of the services waiver, I, I've, I've, I've written on, on this recently with uh, a former student of mine. And what we've tried to do is to just disentangle this issue by sector and by mode of supply and try to understand why is it that so long into this worthy initiative, an idea of Norway initially, uh, this is a worthy initiative, but why is it that you know, seven, eight years, ten years down the road, we're still finding it very difficult to, tra to translate that idea into something that is of operational meaning to the end users, to the clients, mm -hmm. to the LDCs. And I, I think it's because, for the most part, this has been driven by um, uh, considerations of access, providing preferential means of access, without paying sufficient attention, in my view, uh, to uh, supply-side constraints and capacity. The reason why LDCs don't export more is not because the world is unfair, it's because they don't have the capacity to make use of the preferences that are being granted. In a recent interview in an ICD publication, the ambassador of Rwanda, an LDC, by the way, an LDC that aspires to not being an LDC <laughs> as quickly as possible. I just finished, as part of a World Bank team, a chapter on the Rwanda vision of its strategy for services. And trust me, it's not an LDC strategy. It's a value-added moving into becoming, in effect, uh, the Singapore of East Africa, being a regional service hub. Um, and you don't become a regional service hub by remaining an LDC. So I think we have to be very, very pragmatic and focus more on capacity constraints and on the forms of aid for trade and capacity building that are going to help LDC firms, workers, to overcome the constraints that, you know, I can, I can give you as much access as you want, uh, you're not going to be able to satisfy the regulatory requirements in my market. I'm not going to lower those requirements. This is not happening. And we're not going to lower prudential standards in financial markets, and we're not going to lower uh, protection standards in regulated professions uh, and so on. So anything that involves a preference relating to qualitative elements of regulation is simply a non-starter. And that, of course, reduces the scope of what is doable to essentially quantity-based preferences. I'm going to expand the quota of permissible professions or permissible trades for which I allow some degree of preferential access to my labor market under whatever conditions. I'm willing to waive or to lower certain fees to comply with domestic regulations, the fees relating to the granting of a visa, fees relating to the establishment of an enterprise, and so on, but not capital requirements, which are typically requirements that are rooted in prudential norms that are held to be important um, to the functioning of a market economy. It's very, very difficult to dilute those kinds of standards. Now, if we look at these issues from a modal perspective, um, we also have wrong. But let me, let me, just before I go to modal, just two facts that I think are also absent from the conversation. Hadil pointed to it, and I think very rightly so. Most LDCs trade with other LDCs mm. or with developing countries. Very few of them trade with developed market economies. And so they trade with countries towards which, for the most part, the requests are not directed. Most LDCs are in Africa, and most African LDCs trade with one another, mm. with the country at the border, mm. not, more, not more than at the border. Much of that trade is informal 
retail trade at the border, not even captured in official statistics very often. Hadil is right. You will find examples of Senegalese uh, companies that provide online graphic design services to studios in France. Yes, those great stories exist. Those companies don't need the service waiver. <laughs> you know, they're very sophisticated actors. And there are some Laotian banks, Laotian banks, <laughs> banks from Laos that have ATM machines in Cambodia or in Thailand where there are diaspora populations. But th those are such anecdotal examples that I think we should not be, I mean, we should be pragmatic and we should be realistic in just looking at these examples. So A, where do, where do these countries trade? They trade at the border for the most part and they trade informally and they trade mostly in retail activities. That and tourism. Second point, let me go through the four modes and say, well, what would be the meaning of a mode, of, of a preference per mode? Because we have to think this through. How do we operationalize this? Mode one, increasingly cross-border trade, uh, is increasingly taking digital forms. Mm. And it is extraordinarily difficult. Think of it. I can't even think of it myself. How do we grant a preference to digital transactions. It's not so easy to do. How do you do that? In the cloud, oh, there's, that's a Bangladeshi transaction, I think. No, that's a, no, no preference to this one, but the preference. It's just very difficult to do for what is becoming in mode one the most vibrant source of cross-border trade, and that is remotely supplied trade over electronic networks. And I say nothing of the fact that, for the most part, uh, LDC suppliers are not terribly active because of capacity constraints and so on. And by the way, should I add, sadly, uh, these are precisely the countries uh, who, in the WTO, when you say, let's discuss e-commerce, they say, no, no, <laughs> yes. no, we don't want to discuss that. Uh, <laughs> five minutes ago mm. at MC11. So, you know, Houston, we have a problem because there's no coherence in the stances that some of these countries take, the African group, the LDC group, steadfastly opposes the launch of negotiations on e-commerce that, in my view, would trigger a massive trade-related technical assistance response, addressing precisely the kinds of bottlenecks that stand in the way of greater uh, digital penetration by their producers. But by saying no to negotiations, you deprive yourself of that technical assistance response. Mode two. Felipe, you need to tell me, what is mode two about? Is it about I, Canada, allowing my consumers to go abroad? Or is it about how I treat foreign consumers in my territory? OK, imports and exports. Well, what are the three most important sectors for mode two consumption? It's health, education, and tourism, okay? Who the hell is gonna go to an LDC for medical treatment? Can we be honest for a second? I mean, okay, if I break my leg on a mountain in Nepal, uh, I will seek medical assistance close by. But am I gonna go to Nepal for cancer treatment? It's just not happening. It's not happening because it's an LDC and LDCs, for the most part, do not have world-class medical facilities capable of attracting medical tourists on a scale that would be transformative. And you could, you know, I'm, try I'm sorry, this may sound a bit harsh, but it's just the reality. You could almost say the same thing of education or higher education. Um, universities in LDCs may attract students from neighboring countries, but not on a scale, again, that will transform higher education uh, into a major source of foreign exchange earnings. Um, and then, of course, tourism, yes, tourism is the number one export activity of LDCs, uh, because a lot of LDCs are in the south, where there is an abundance of either sun, beach, sand, or uh, mountains that, uh, that uh, attract tourists. 
But then again, on tourism, what impact does trade policy have on tourism? Does anyone respond to the fact that, oh, I've scheduled full commitments in all the subsectors of tourism? No, you go, you go to a country because it's safe, the likelihood of being murdered is low, uh, the culture is rich and vibrant, the handicrafts are, are attractive, there is culture, there are things to do and see. Trade policy has virtually no impact on tourism, none. And even less so because the part of tourism that brings the tourists to you, aviation for the most part, we don't discuss in trade policy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the number one export sector is one that occurs despite trade, not because of, of trade. It occurs because you may promote your country as a tourism destination. And some countries do that very well, including some poorer countries. Um, but it's a highly competitive market because a lot of countries have those attributes that will make uh, you want to come uh, to the country. Mode three, another tough one. You know, most LDCs are LDCs because they are net importers of capital. They're not exporters of capital. So I'm just wondering, if I grant you a preference in Canada, my home country, if I grant Nepal uh, a mode three preference to invest in Canada, what is that going to consist of? What kind of a preference am I going to give you? I, I, I'm going to give you special incentives to establish an operation in my country. I'm going to give you special tax breaks that I don't give others. For the most part, it doesn't work that way. And, you know, LDCs are not, with very few exceptions in very few sectors, significant exporters of capital. What they need is FDI. They need inward FDI. So I would say proactive stances by home countries to encourage their investors to invest in LDCs would be more useful. But that's, again, development promotion. You cannot compel any company to invest in Nepal or to invest in Haiti. Companies are sovereign in their decisions of where they invest. Um, so, again, a bit of a difficulty in, in a, just finding the operational means to make a mode three preference commercially meaningful. And then mode four, well, what can I say about mode four? You know, <laughs> it's the toughest nut to crack in services trade. You know, we love foreign money, but we don't like foreigners. <laughs> uh, this is the crudest way of putting it. And uh, by the way, foreigners, not only from LDCs, from anywhere. Um, and so mode four, which represents less than 5% of world trade and services, less than 5%, is the most restricted form of trade. And if you look at the LDC request, it concentrates legitimately and rationally on mode four, but it's so it concentrates on this, the mode of supply that is the least traded, that is the most restricted, and that is the most politically sensitive. So you shouldn't expect miracles on mode four. I question whether there's even a role for trade to play in labor mobility. And if I look at how countries manage mobility, they do it for the most part outside of trade agreements, outside of trade policy. Mm -hmm. The countries that do migration policy well, temporary migration policy well, are countries that negotiate bilateral guest worker programs with destination countries and manage the welfare of their citizens who engage in that kind of circular work. They do not use trade agreements for the most part. Trade agreements focus on high-end, highly qualified people Highly qualified, skilled professionals are in short supply uh, in LDCs, and you wouldn't want to provide incentives for temporary mobility to result in permanent uh, brain drain. So again, 
are we focusing on the right instrument? It may well be that Nepal and Bangladesh and other countries would be better served by simply negotiating bilateral agreements like many other more advanced countries negotiate. I give an example. One of the countries that exports the most people in the world per capita is the Philippines. The Philippines do not pay any attention to mode four discussions in the WTO. They justifiably have come to the conclusion the WTO is useless on mode four. It's not going to happen on an MFN basis. Here we're not in an MFN logic, I grant you. But still, they understand that their interests are served by focusing on specific professions, specific trades, and negotiating with specific countries on a yearly or bi-yearly basis to manage the mobility of their service providers. So again, I, I, I just bring it back to the reality of the sectors or the modes, and my conclusion is not that this is not important, not that LDCs should not export more services, they should, and they are, but A, we need to build capacity and direct uh, aid for trade at precisely the kinds of bottlenecks that you are most likely to encounter, and not really focus so much on access, but on capacity for the most part, and capacity will lead to access, in my view. Uh, and, and, and second, uh, to be very clear on how difficult for some modes um, it is to actually operationalize uh, the, the, the waiver. So focus on quantity-based restrictions to trade much more than quality or regulatory areas uh, because it will be extraordinarily difficult for a regulator to justify the dilution of regulatory standards in any country. No regulator will keep his job if he espouses that agenda. So, you know, let's focus on what is doable, let's not expect miracles, and let's keep investing in people, in trade promotion, in scaling up SMEs and so on, in providing them with technological platforms in which they can use. And that is primarily a domestic challenge to which the international aid community uh, is capable of responding. By expecting trade to do more than trade can do, you set yourself up for a bit of a disappointment. I stop there. <coughs> Thank you, <coughs> Professor Shub. Sorry, I had to say that. <laughs> Those things are just things that I had to say. I know it's like I'm, I'm the party pooper here, but I'm sorry. Okay, you, you. I'm, I'm, I'm done. You're done. <laughs> well, with you, well, Professor Shob, I agree with you that I mean, it's not fun to be in this level of country. <laughs> I mean, we have to graduate. And I also agree I mean, with you. To, to, to create, I mean, I don't know whether it is possible under the existing WTO provision to create a new category, newly graduated yes, in this year. And, and have, I mean, you some, have to. Yeah, I mean, so some, so some provisions or some flexibility to those countries. But, but, but I don't think I mean, existing, existing provision allows I mean, to have this flexibility for newly graduating countries. It's a political, yeah. it's a political initiative. So, so, so maybe, I mean, it could be on agenda on the part of the LDC, yes. the graduating LDC, I mean, the, in, in negotiation. I agree, I mean, fully agree with you. And, and I have one question, Sam, particularly, I mean, as per your, I mean, for in mode one, it's not, so, I mean, possible, so, I mean, to provide any preference. Mode two, it's not feasible. Mode three, I mean, it's not forgeable. I, again, I mean, for more three, the LDC, they want I an mean, inward investment rather than outward That's investment. Right. And mode four, it's, it's politically I mean, sensitive, I mean, for, for developed countries or for that matter, other de developing countries, I mean, to open up I mean, labor forces or foreigners I mean, to, to their own country. So, so my question is, is there any value of GATS? I mean, to LDC or developing countries. And, and I mean, from so looking behind, I mean, from retrospection, 
during Uruguay round, developing countries and the ULDC, they are quite I mean, reluctant I mean, to, 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 to negotiate or to include services under this I mean, multilateral regime. So what you, so what you say, I mean, what is your views? I know? Are they right? LDC and developing countries, I mean, their positions, I mean, not to include services in multilateral trade regime. And that is their position in during Uruguay round. So in the retrospect, I mean, developing countries and LDC are right. No. And, 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 and one thing, I mean, from your I mean, perspective, services and particularly service trade cannot be a means I mean, to, to, to have some transformational change in developing and least developed countries. Mm. I mean, uh, of course, to say no to services, to say no to a sector that accounts for two-thirds of GDP and 50% more or more uh, of employment makes strictly no sense from a development perspective. You have to embrace the need for international cooperation and governance to play a role in the development of domestic service economies. At the end of the day, what are international treaties about? They're about the codification of a number of sound principles of good governance. They're about principles of transparency, of proportionality, of non-discrimination, of fairness, um, and, and so on, of adjudication when uh, partner countries do stupid things. I mean, why would you not want to make use of that? They're also instruments of signaling. They allow you, by undertaking legally binding and enforceable commitments that are not easily reversed. They can always be reversed, but they're not so easy to reverse, and most countries never reverse their, their commitments. To use that as a means to signal that your policy regime is predictable and guaranteed. Do you want or not to attract investment? A country like Brazil or South Africa or Indonesia or Russia or India or China, they do not face the same constraints. Their domestic markets are so big, they would make no commitments and they would still receive a lot of FDI. But when you are a very small landlocked LDC in the middle of Africa, trust me, it's very difficult to get the attention of foreign investors and therefore international treaties and the good governance principles that are embedded in them that help you conduct the reform process to anchor reforms into these principles is important as well as to signal the direction of change in the policy regime. But we should not again expect miracles. My final observation on this point would be again to express dismay at the fact that whenever we discuss LDCs in the WTO, including just down the road, um, we tend to say to LDCs, but don't worry, these rules do not apply to you. You don't have to make commitments. You don't have to assume any obligations. And therefore, these good governance principles, literally, they're not really for you. And I, if I were an LDC, I would find that actually insulting. Of course they're for me. They're for me first and foremost because I need to just move up the development ladder. So I, again, it means we're going to have to have a serious conversation mm. eye to eye on special and differential treatment. You know, how is that working for you? I don't think it's working very well. When you are exempted from everything, when you're under no obligation from the international treaties you sign, what is the purpose of those treaties? And how does that help you anchor the domestic reform process? It doesn't. Mm. And I, again, I, 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 you know, I don't want to be the person who paraphrases Robert Lighthizer here, <laughs> but I think we need a conversation on development in the WTO because it's just not working. It's just not working. Adel, you, you, you Thank you, Pash. I'd like to uh, make some uh, remarks um, inspired but by what uh, Pierre uh, just mentioned. He talked about capacity constraints by LDCs and that this is one of the main uh, constraints that is inhibiting their services um, exports. I agree. I think capacity constraints are 
significant LDC services exporters and producers, they face significant problems at home in, 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 in LDCs from infrastructure, weaknesses in infrastructure to high cost of doing business to uh, insufficient regulatory uh, frameworks at home, uh, access to finance, you name it. But I do believe that market access and trade stimulates capacities and enhance capacities. I just came back from actually two missions uh, to two LDCs in preparation for, uh, for, 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 the, for the session that um, um, I uh, spoke at yesterday, um, in Nepal and Cambodia. And in Cambodia, I met with um, producers of uh, animation services uh, who are ready to expand their um, production um, hire many more animators if they can have market access. And we're not talking about reducing the standards for LDCs in order for them to be able to export. I mean, I agree with you, Pierre, this has never been the issue, not for goods and not for services. We're not talking about reducing the quality of regulations or the quality of the uh, regulatory protection in order to allow LDCs to export their services. What we're talking about is, uh, or are services that are top quality, uh, world-class services that are inhibited. One of the problems that this uh, any studio, animation studio is facing is that they don't have access to, um, um, to, to um, um, markets um, that, that, that provide state funding for animation. Because when you get state funding, then you are required to, um, basically there's a local content requirement, 100% local content requirement. So if we can relax that, then this will allow uh, these uh, animation studios to hire many more people, train them, um, and, and export more animation services. The other issue, so capacity constraints are serious. Donors should place enough attention. LDC governments should work on reducing the capacity constraints, and there's a lot of work that is needed. Um, to uh, s streamline the regulations and, and ease business for, for, for service providers. But this should go in parallel to opening markets for the top quality um, LDC services exports. The other issue that I also would like to uh, share my insights on is um, what types of restrictions do we have in mode one? Not many. In mode one, we don't have many restrictions. There was the issue of localization of service. I think today with the cloud um, servers, the, the issue has subsided. But mode one is very much connected with mode four. And I'm not talking about the labor mobility in mode four. I agree this can be done outside and should be done outside the, the WTO at this point. I'm talking about the regulatory issues that the GATT very much deals with, which is facilitated visa procedures, maybe reducing visa fees, uh, providing um, uh, reasons for denial of visas, uh, facilitating uh, access to work permits or the duration of the work permit, and so on and so forth. All this is being dealt with in PTAs and partly unilaterally provided by some of the WTO members. So what we need is to look at what can be done in order to facilitate the access of the service provider from LDCs who has legitimate business interests in the uh, export market so that these people can go and have meetings with their clients. Because you cannot export indefinitely, even if the export happens via mode one, without meeting your client. People deal with and trade with people that they know, that they like. So if you cannot go and meet with your client, if, you, if, if an artist cannot go and participate in a film festival, if an animator cannot go and participate in events that happen, a musician cannot go to perform music, then the export of the service will be reduced or hampered. So reducing and facilitating visa procedures um, and, and, and related matters very much affects the exports in mode one. And this is where the attention should be, um, should be, should be at. On mode three, I think there are lots of uh, issues that can be done, but because most of the exports in mode three happen in the regions, meaning with other LDCs and other developing countries, um, I think we have to have also a conversation on who should offer and who should uh, provide preferences. Our preferences should uh, preferences only be provided by developed countries or also by LDCs themselves to each other and by developing countries more than what we have today. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have two minutes and 23 seconds left. 
Maybe we want to listen them from the floor. So we have just two, two minutes and 15 seconds. Oh, oh okay. Uh, microphone, please. Uh, Dirk Tevelde from ODI. Um, uh, great debate. I missed a bit part of the first presentation. Um, I mean, I think we all agree that I suppose capacity constraints are, are the most severe constraint and probably the most binding constraint in most of the, the areas. I think that's probably, um, uh, probably true. Uh, having said that, there, there are likely to be um, uh, some specific constraints that, are still, that still exist, and I think that's where we need to focus on. Um, I mean, the Fiji issue that you mentioned is exactly right, and I think I just came from an example in the UK where uh, um, an insurance company, head of an insurance company, when he wants to meet with a key Nigerian official, invite him over, is, find it easier to uh, bring them over to Brussels mm -hmm. to get a Schengen visa than to, get, <laughs> than to bring them over to, uh, to London, and that just doesn't faci facilitate um, uh, trade at all, and, it's, uh, and, and I suppose this is the case in London, but there are, uh, even Schengen visa is already can be quite uh, difficult sometimes to get at. So I think we need to have, have much more attention to those sort of issues. And I would have thought that the H-1B visa uh, in, the sort of in, the, in the original gets uh, signaled uh, something positive. So here we have got a particular quota um, for, for, um, uh, for a number of, uh, of uh, IT pro prof professionals to come into the US. US. So I, th I would have thought that that was a, you can combine those issues. You can say, well, let's signal um, that we are open in a certain targeted areas and we're going to manage it well and we have an economic need test it is maybe negative from some perspectives but it's very positive to have it in the case of say the uk to sort of say well actually um we have an economic needs test and we say um let's let's uh, let's allow uh, a number of mig uh, migrants to come in of temporarily um whilst at the same time uh, adjusting to this and compensate some of the losers because otherwise you lose the debate as well in the UK. So I think there is a, a, a sort of a targeted, comprehensive um, action around uh, temporary mobility schemes where gets could be used to, to sort of signal that, that, that you're open. I think that could be quite, quite a quite positive action to take. First of all, I would like to thank the panelists for a very interesting, inspiring uh, session. Um, I love it. Anyway, I have two quick questions. I don't know when I have time to answer this question. The first one, you mentioned about four modes, you know, some difficulty for developing uh, LDCs to uh, make good use of waiver. But I would like to know a little bit about mode five. For example, for developing can LDC, can they make good use of the value chain through the mode five? But I probably difficult question, I don't know. The second question will be <coughs> like uh, the TISA negotiation. Like uh, what are the implications for LDC exactly? Does, whatever they are going to negotiate the TISA, is that good for LDCs or bad? Anyway, quick. Okay. I mean, TISA is a disaster. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and, and thank God it's dead. Um, and, and so and no LDC would have participated in that agreement, and the door was closed. Uh, a country the size of China wanted to participate and was kept outside of the room. Um, this was an agreement bred out of frustration on the part of a few OECD countries who wanted to gang up uh, and create a new global regime for services. When we have an existing global regime, that we are unable to improve because some countries keep saying no to any new initiatives. But um, so the TISA would have done nothing for LDCs because LDCs were simply not party to uh, these agreements, this agreement. That is why um, Hadil's idea, and I think also Professor Rahman, about extending automatically best PTA treatment to all LDCs uh, would be a very easy formula. Mm -hmm to apply across the board. It should have been a gift that we brought you know, in, a, in an otherwise very uh, unsuccessful ministerial. We could have at least made that gesture. Um, but uh, TISA, in other words, if, if we were willing to multilateralize or to extend TISA outcomes only to the LDCs on a preferential basis, maybe that would have been good. But they would certainly not have been at the table. 
uh, had that had that negotiation pursued. Mode five, I still don't understand what mode five is, and I think it's just a cute, a cute little concept that is. Uh, analytically interesting because it recalls how services are embedded in goods but of limited operational uh, value to negotiation. So I think it's not terribly relevant uh, mm -hmm. to this conversation. My view. How did, do you want I, to add I agree on, with uh, Pierre. On, on, on capacity constraints? I said what I said. On I don't <laughs> oh, okay. repeat myself. I, I agree. I think we should look at at the issue of capacity constraints with seriousness, but we should not stop there and we should in parallel also open markets and work on extending regulatory facilitation of services that are on the regulatory front uh, to, to LDCs. Thank you. So now the board has one zero some seconds left. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm not taking examine I mean, any time. I would like to thank Professor thank you. Shav, Hadil Rehmanswoman, Sorry, Professor Raymond and all participants for your time. And I request, I mean, all of you to give big hand to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much.